Good afternoon and welcome. I'm Michael Fitzgerald, the new editor-in-chief of Harvard Public Health, the magazine of the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. On behalf of the Harvard Chan School and the magazine, I welcome you to today's panel, Calling a Pandemic Ceasefire, Vaccinating in Conflict Zones. This panel was sparked by a fascinating article written for Undark by Madeline Drexler, an accomplished journalist and my predecessor at Harvard Public Health magazine. Her piece highlights one of the most challenging arenas for public health, how to bring care to people in conflict zones. The pandemic has made such efforts urgent because of the potential for these conflict zones to become hotspots for new variants of the virus. It is easy to overlook this aspect of public health, trying to provide preventive care for people who are caught in the midst of armed conflict. Most of us want to stay away from such places. But the Chan School emphasizes reaching all people, not just those who are easy to reach, which makes this topic a core part of its purpose. For today's discussion, we've convened experts from across the spectrum of public health. We are fortunate to have as moderator, Alana Gordon, a healthcare journalist and audio producer who has also worked as a prevention specialist and HIV counselor in a free health clinic. Alana is currently covering global health for the national radio program, The World, a co-production of GBH and PRX. The Harvard Chan School is pleased to be co-presenting this with The World and GBH. I'm delighted to turn this over to Alana. Thank you so much, Michael. And I want to thank everyone for joining us today. Um, and I want to now introduce our guests for today's conversation, which I know is going to be extremely rich and important. Madeline Drexler, as you just heard, is a journalist and visiting scientist at Harvard's T.H. Chan School of Public Health. And again, you just heard from Michael about Madeline's work covering this important topic today uh, that we are now discussing. So Madeline, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Um, also joining us is Esperanza Martinez. Uh, Esperanza is head of the COVID-19 crisis team for the International Committee of the Red Cross. Thank you so much, Esperanza. Thank you. Claude Broderlein is director of the Center of Competence on Humanitarian Negotiation and an adjunct lecturer on global health at Harvard's T.H. Chan School of Public Health. Claude, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Irena. And Jennifer Leaning is a senior research fellow at the FXB Center for Health and Humanitarian Rights at Harvard University. She's also an associate professor of emergency medicine at Harvard's medical school. Thank you so much, Jennifer. Thank you, Alana. So to everyone tuning in, we are streaming live on the website, The Forum. We are also streaming on Facebook and YouTube. And viewers, you can submit your questions by email to theforum at hsph.harvard.com. Edu. We heard a little bit from Michael earlier about the importance of this conversation um, and picking things up from there. I want to just talk about how almost half of the world's population has received at least one dose of a COVID-19 vaccine, but in many low-income countries and especially places experiencing uh, violent conflict, the vaccination rate is so much lower. Sometimes it's less than 1%. So what we want to ask today and explore is why have vaccination efforts for people living in conflict zones failed so far? We'll be looking at the unique challenges that this pandemic presents, and we'll also ask whether vaccinating the world is an achievable goal or even the right goal right now. So to kick off this discussion, I want to start with a short video. It's filmed at the Al-Hal camp in Syria, which is a place that houses people who've been displaced by armed conflict. The video is from the International Committee of the Red Cross, uh, which is the organization that our panelist Esperanza Martinez represents. It's already hot, pushing 35 degrees, when Ahmada starts his one-hour commute to work. The bus takes Ahmada and his colleagues to Al Hal in northeastern Syria. Just outside of Al Hal, there's a camp for 65,000 people displaced by conflict. It's just 10 o'clock in the morning, it is about 40 degrees hot outside there. Uh, this is a life in our home. So this is a emergency room, and especially now with the COVID, we having challenges too hot here, and sometimes we receive a lot of patients, but here we have only four beds. Uh, you can imagine living in the tent when it's plus 50 degrees, you know. It's too hot. You don't have any AC and, and fan to, to keep you calm. So, so also, by that time, you have a lot of challenge of children with a, a lot of dehydration and things like that. 
especially with the COVID, you have high fever. The sun is burning you and the, 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 the body fever is too high. So I, I think it's, it's not good at all. Roughly 80% of the people in this camp are women and children, many of them have pre-existing conditions. We have a lot of children with asthma also problems and uh, some few cases of TB also. Almost like over 100 a day we are receiving this kind of patient with a lunch problem, both children and adults. So I want to pick up from that video that we just saw. Um, as you can see, it was before COVID-19 vaccines were available. And already you can view that there's a lot of challenges with even getting basic care to people who are impacted by conflict. Um, Madeline, I wanna start with you to kind of set the foundation for this conversation um, because now we're adding vaccines to this list. You've reported on how difficult this is even before COVID-19. And I wanted to kick off with you and ask um, what drew you to focus on this and why is it so hard? Uh well, I've been interested in this topic uh, since long before COVID-19. I've been uh, collecting materials on the subject for a, a number of years. Uh, what interested me initially was just this uh, stark moral question. You know, when do combatants lay down their arms in order to permit vaccination campaigns? You know, what's, what's their calculus? And uh, now having written the story, I realize that's a, a really naive question. Um, but, but there are precedents for immunization ceasefires uh, back in 1960s, 1970s. The WHO smallpox eradication campaign had a, had a work around conflict zones. And then in the uh, 1980s, 1990s in Central America, a UNICEF negotiated with uh, rebel groups these, these three-day ceasefires during which um, hundreds of thousands of children received uh, polio vaccinations and, and other basic childhood immunizations. Uh, and that model was so successful that WHO uh, adopted it for uh, you know, uh, ceasefire vaccination campaigns around the world. Um, but those those uh, negotiate those uh, negotiated ceasefires were known as days of tranquility, which is uh, such a poetic phrase. But I think in the context of COVID nineteen, it's a really wrenching phrase because um, there are so many obstacles right now to delivering these these vaccinations to conflict zones. I mean, one is is that you're giving the vaccine to adults, not not just to children and to adults first. Uh, it's a, it's a two-dose regimen. Uh, there is misinformation, disinformation everywhere. Um, and you know, a lot of people may not fear COVID-19 as much as as much as they do smallpox and polio. But uh, really the biggest hurdle is is this vaccine shortage. Um, the COVAX facility, which is distributing uh, vaccines to low-income countries all around the world, is, is desperately short of doses. So um, really, there's a, a global equity problem right now. Thank you so much for setting uh, the grounds for this conversation. I want to move to Esperanza now um, and following up for Madeline. Um, when you get into these zones, how conflict zones, how do these vaccine campaigns move forward? Like the earlier ones that Madeline described, um, and what do you see as some of the biggest challenges? Obviously, a, a big one right there now is uh, the vaccines themselves. Yes, thank you, Alana. And as Madeline said, I think one of the biggest challenges globally is this persistent inequity between countries in terms of vaccine distribution and. Elena, you refer to half, almost half of the world haven't received one dose, but we need to unpack that a little bit and realize that on one hand, we have countries that have more than 80% of the populations vaccinated, like the UAE, Portugal, Chile, or Singapore. And on the other hand, we have these countries that have less than two, 1% of the population with, with only one dose. And many of those contexts are affected by armed conflict. So we have, for example, the Democratic Republic of Congo, South Sudan, Burkina Faso, Mali. 
So this is the reality we have today. So it's just the stark contrast. But then besides this challenge, we have the element of having to distribute the vaccines in country. And in armed conflict, one of the key elements is that the protracted nature of conflict generally weakens health systems and key parts of the health system that are needed for vaccination are rendered dysfunctional. You all have heard the news about destruction of health facilities in Yemen or in Syria. And we know that the warehousing capacity and the coaching capacity in many countries in Africa today is not going to be sufficient to handle the volumes of vaccines that are required. So that's, that's a big element. And the other thing is war displaces people and people include healthcare workers. So the capacity in the human resources uh, level to handle vaccination and on what is required in a pandemic is not there. And additional elements to the health system, for example, infrastructure, roads, bridges, water, and electricity to run the cold chain is often not there. An additional element is access and security. The ICRC estimates that today there are about 50 million people that live under full control of non-state armed groups and another 100 million in fluid areas in and out of countries. Of, of conflict. And basically, it, this means that access to these populations and, and for these people to access health services, there is a negotiation with a significant number of, of armed groups, many of them with different objectives, different beliefs. And finally, I would say the element, uh, a big challenge is the element related to people's hesitation and, and hesit hesitancy to get vaccinated or resistance. And here we need to say that vaccination campaigns are often seen as suspicious by armed groups. But apart from that, there are historic, cultural, religious issues that might prevent groups from getting vaccinated. And finally, in armed conflict and in violence, in areas affected by violence, you have a huge level of distrust in authorities, in armed groups, and in humanitarian actors. And, and this is a fertile ground for misinformation and disinformation as another big challenge. That is a lot to be taking into account and coordinating in your role. And, and it's kind of overwhelming. And uh, it's also interesting to hear you say that in some ways the nature of conflicts is changing too with some of these um, different kinds of actors, how you negotiate and gain those trusts. Um, I want to move to Claude to kind of build on that. Um, based on what you've seen, um, why are we falling so short on vaccinations in conflict zones, you know, beyond hearing all of the challenges that are set forward? And do we need to rethink our goals? Because as I'm also hearing all of you talk, I mean, what is the case for prioritizing also vaccinations in conflict zones right now? Well, thank you, Elena. I think um, the level of result that we see of the COVAX in conflict environment uh, is requiring us to rethink the strategy we have. I mean, COVAX was an excellent idea, it's how we bring equity in the distribution of the vaccines. But the um, low result that we have, I mean, I think the case of Nigeria, for example, and there's a population of 200 million uh, people in Nigeria with a level of vaccination of 2% for double vaccination. This is abysmal as compared to what we should be. If we look at WHO goals for, for uh, 2021 is 40%. And we have countries are really falling out of uh, this goal. We're talking about 70% uh, for mid 2022. There is simply no way that the countries in conflict will reach um, any of these goals. And that it begs the questions, what are we going to do with these countries? Hundreds of millions of people live in these countries, and there is no real understanding of the reality of vaccination of these countries. And um, I mean, I take the point about ceasefire, but actually the problem is not the conduct of hostilities in many of these cases, the lack of uh, infrastructure, as uh, um, mentioned, the lack of uh, of prevention culture, uh, the lack of access to a proper healthcare system. This is decades of um, deprivation and destruction of, uh, of um, public infrastructure and that really questions how we're gonna handle it. So um, looking forward, I think we need to look again at COVAX and not only have this one size fits all equity model, but start to look into efficiency to say, 
you know, if we want to really address the pandemic and to look into uh, ways to enhance um, our strategy to prevent mutation, for example, we cannot simply have a universal approach. We'll need to focus our attention on countries, populations uh, that are the most vulnerable for um, you know, infection and mutation. And this is not to stigmatize these populations, but really to look into, as we did with um, you know, age, but to look now uh, globally, to look into populations that are the most vulnerable to these uh, infection and therefore mutation. We need to rethink um, uh, our approach and build um, a response that will address the specific uh, needs and context that we have in specific con countries in a way we can support uh, the infrastructure in delivering these vaccines. Thank you. And just to clarify with COVAX, that's this global mechanism that basically looks at distributing about 20% vaccines to cover about 20% of a population. And the idea has been it's to go across the board, low and middle income countries, wealthier countries can buy into it, but they've also been going directly and racing to get vaccines. And what you're, and within those 20%, the idea is to prioritize um, different populations that are higher, highest at risk. So just to clarify and, and compare what you're talking about kind of shifting now in this moment. Um, I want to move to um, Jennifer now, as we think about all these things, um, some of it is longstanding, like healthcare infrastructure, as Cloud mentioned. Um, but what about COVID-19 is different or presents unique challenges? Um, thank you. Yes, I mean, I must say that there, there are a number of very new things that we're dealing with. Uh, <clears throat> first of all, what is not new? Vaccination campaigns are familiar to people, even in conflict affected areas, um, especially against measles, but also childhood vaccinations more generally. And this is a credit to the international humanitarian community, the work that's been going on for generations, actually. <clears throat> uh, the, but the needs of people in conflict settings are for food, water, shelter, safety, as we saw in that video, and high levels of suspicion relating to the unfamiliar are always prevalent. And the process of COVID-19 vaccination introduces new barriers and much unfamiliarity. Uh, first of all, the people getting vaccinated are adults, not children. And children are um, more universally recognized as vulnerable and subject to protection by many parties to a conflict. Uh, whereas adults in conflict zones, they come heavily valenced. They have a profile that can be assessed quite quickly and often will um, come from um, a population that is at odds with another population that's close by and that conflict um, uh, bearers are ones that um, are very suspicious of adults, whether they are you know, crossing into um, a healthcare zone where they're going to be greeted by humanitarians or whether they're leaving and trying to go home to whatever counts as shelter in the conflict setting. Um, there's just moving to get to healthcare if you're an adult is a more complicated thing in, in conflict zones. Um, and furthermore, as been mentioned, the priorities for healthcare in conflict zones do not include this strange addition of COVID-19. Um, this is unfamiliar. Other things that contribute to the suspicion, the alienation are that PPP, PPE um, is very alienating to people. I mean, they're used to seeing people in white coats and um, <clears throat> wearing goggles in certain situations. But uh, after that, um, this distancing is not a good idea in terms of getting people um, from the population feeling comfortable about going to a health post where um, there's all this paraphernalia attached to it. Uh, and the facility support for the cold chain will add more formality to this encounter. And every issue comes up when it's unfamiliar, it is also a barrier. Um, another, another point that I'd like to make is that records are gonna have to be kept of who you are, um, where you are, and how are we, the um, purveyors of healthcare, going to be finding you in six months or a year for um, revaccination and a booster. And um, this is intrusive. 
since people are already afraid of being identified and being known and uh, coming out of the pack and being individuals in the face of authority. So all of this is going to create difficulties in getting people to welcome healthcare workers who are providing COVID vaccination only. Now I know that it's not likely to be COVID vaccination only, uh, but since we've not seen vaccination in much of the conflict affected world yet, it is going to be a negotiable um, problem, I think. Thank you so much for adding that to this conversation. Also, just in before we move on and mentioning health workers, um, are there additional challenges with appearing neutral, for example, with COVID? Is that different? <clears throat> well, I think um, I think healthcare workers have to maintain um, a sensibility um, that they are being watched, that every action that they take will be perceived as um, friendly and competent or as perhaps alienating or a sign of their um, distance from the population. Uh, so that the um, barrier introduced by PPE is considerable. Um, and um, I, I believe that in the vaccination context where it's not known what the COVID prevalence is, um, people will need, that as healthcare workers, will need to be careful about maintaining PPE. And uh, so that is, um, I think, a, a, new, a new variant from the standpoint of being able to uh, create a connection with people, looking at them, smiling at them, um, reassuring people. Um, if you're wearing a mask, even your voice is um, muffled. So there are some issues here about um, conveying the integrity of the um, neutrality of the healthcare process. Um, there are going to be some issues uh, introduced by the uh, sort of structural and ergonomic barriers of COVID vaccination. Well, I look forward to digging in deeper in just a moment. For example, Esperanza and how this actually looks on the ground and how you build that neutrality. Um, I want to remind everyone tuning in that this is the forum at Harvard's T.H. Chan School of Public Health, presented jointly with the world from PRX and GBH. As we now dig deeper, um, I want to remind viewers you can send your questions to the forum at hsph.harvard.edu. And to start off this next part of the discussion, I wanted us to watch a short clip. It's from last March, and it's about the arrival of vaccines in Somalia. And this clip is courtesy of Reuters. Somalia has received its first consignment of vaccines under the COVAX Global Sharing Scheme, precisely a year after its first case of coronavirus was detected. 300,000 shots of AstraZeneca vaccines arrived in the Horn of Africa country on Monday. Minister of Health Dr. Fozia Abikar Noor was at the Aden Abdullah International Airport in Mogadishu to receive them. After tireless efforts, we've managed to receive the first batch of the vaccine and we're expecting to receive more. I want to commend the efforts of health workers across Somalia for their efforts in saving lives. May God grant paradise to those who have died. The first groups to be targeted for inoculation are frontline workers, the elderly and people with chronic health conditions. But carrying out the government's planned mass vaccination drives will be challenging. Many areas of the country riven with conflict have lost basic infrastructure. Roads, bridges, telecoms and power often weakened or obliterated. Health workers risk death, injury or abduction to do their jobs. The UN has hailed the Somali authorities for their efforts to combat COVID-19 and pledged continuing support to the nationwide vaccination program. Sticking with Somalia, actually, Cloud, you've spoken with health workers there um, and in building on this conversation, what, how is that going? What have you been hearing over the last few months? Well, it brings to your question about neutrality. You know, 
government plans and public health is part of government responsibilities are perceived by armed groups as being, um, you know, intrusive, not being in respect of their political objective, and they have not participated in the elaboration of these plans. So what's come from the capital is often seen with suspicion or simply hostility. In the case of Somalia, the Shabab armed groups and others have declared their opposition to the vaccination programs and um, health professionals um, living and working in areas controlled by armed groups, which is the vast majority of the territory of Somalia, are unable to proceed with the vaccination. We have a colleague uh, on location who has, uh, you know, important stock of vaccine, is unable to operate. Uh, she told us recently that um, she received death threats associated with the vaccination program, and she's simply not going to vaccinate. Um, and this is something we find in many other locations. Um, this uh, this notion of a ceasefire is also one of uh, of uh, uh, recognizing that uh, in health policy or objective of vaccination is not one of the government. And how can we regain the participation of all the political actors in the country, which is a problem. Many of these groups are listed terrorist organization. Uh, you're not allowed in these countries to engage with them or negotiate with them. So this is one of the obstacles we find in Somalia and other places. Um, I want to point this perhaps to Jennifer um, or and Madeline, but is yeah. health itself neutral then? I mean, is that because then vaccinations become something um, that's difficult in itself, as, as Claude had alluded to? No, I don't think health is perceived as neutral um, in general. I mean, one one has to think in terms of uh, the overall structure of people's perceptions. They, they, they've been on the move, fleeing, fighting for quite a long time. I, I'm speaking in generalities, but they apply, I think, to most of these settings. Um, they've been hunted down by various um, for, forces um, who perceive them as not aligned with the military. Um, they are uh, struggling to protect their children, um, deal with the dust and the dirt, maintain some semblance of a household, <clears throat> even in the bush. Um, and healthcare is uh, is is sought when people are injured, when they have fevers or feel very ill, and when they come to a health post, they're looking for a place that is um, effectively a clean well-lighted place where uh, there's a, a structure of normality that actually they don't see all the time, but this is linked with what healthcare is. And what they are afraid of is, is they go into this place or approach it, they may be attacked or it may be a ruse, et cetera. So you have to reassure people as healthcare workers, and uh, I've done this more watching as a human rights observer, um, it, People have to be reassured by um, uniforms and white coats and cleanliness and a stability of process and utmost courtesy and good translators who you know have to actually convey of uh, the um, the decency of the healthcare worker even if the healthcare worker doesn't speak the local language and this is um, a process of gaining acceptance um, negotiating access but then maintaining acceptance day after day which requires um, a, a perspective on the part of the healthcare worker and the, the, the staff that are supporting them, um, the recognition that you're always on, you're always being watched. You, you cannot have a bad day, let alone a bad moment when somebody is there. Uh, so it's exhausting. So you're, there's this duplement where you are focused on the patient, one patient at a time, because that is what everybody is watching. Did, that doctor look at me huh, as a human being. You've got to do that. But you also have this situational um, anxiety of what else is around? Is somebody scowling at me? Do I have to actually go to this person next out of line? Uh, why should I do that? So um, it's exhausting work. And it all always is based on recognizing that you cannot count on people trusting you ever. And you could must rely on an implicit dialogue of, is it still okay for me to be doing this? Um, that is at the personal level as a, a healthcare 
provider, but also everyone in that healthcare team has to be looking out for this um, uh, from a variety of directions. It's a very fraught process. And I observing it, um, I'm aware of how fraught it is. I think healthcare workers who have to get used to this tension and this doublement of consciousness day after day, they might not even recognize how very hard it is in terms of um, emotional energy consumption. Well, I want to get more to how you build kind of those broader trusts with you in a moment, Esperanza. But um, Madeline, I mean, part of also what makes this difficult for health workers and these efforts is misinformation. Um, it was something you alluded to earlier. Can you, what is happening? Can you get, I mean, we're seeing this around the globe, whether or not it's conflict zones, but how is this playing out uh, in conflict areas and spreading and creating deeper challenges? Right. Well, misinformation, disinformation is, is rife in conflict zones. Uh, part of it is the globalization of, of the anti-vax movement. But there are also, you know, these, these local trends, local beliefs. Uh, in Nigeria, for example, um, many people think that, the, that COVID-19 itself and that its vaccines were engineered to wipe out African populations. In uh, Somalia, where, where we saw that clip, uh, the, the militant Al-Shabaab movement um, has specifically rejected the AstraZeneca vaccine as unsafe. And in Syria, where you know there, there is a surge of cases right now, um, the state-run radio station told its listeners that uh, uh, the coronavirus loses its potency in the hot climate of the Middle East. So there are there's misinformation, disinformation, but also just uh, politicized falsehoods everywhere, not only in the United States, but really everywhere. And so Esperanza, when we think about how, uh, as you're coordinating COVID-19 vaccinations and planning for them, um, how, how does community engagement play into this? I mean, this is something that Madeline, you've researched a lot in your reporting. Um, how do you cut through that mis or disinformation? Um, what does that look like in these in conflict zones? It's extremely vital to engage with communities. First of all, to assess their understanding of the disease. As Adi was mentioned before by the other panelists, COVID-19 very often in armed conflict uh, situations is not the top priority, it's not even a priority. The priority is food, shelter, essential health services. And therefore the first thing is not to assume or not to go with the assumption that people know what COVID-19 is, how it is transmitted and what does it do, what are the consequences? So it's very difficult when we talk about vaccination to go with a vaccine against something that communities haven't heard of or they don't understand. So investing time and resources in engaging to, with communities is a prerequisite for successful vaccination. How is that done? There are many different ways, but one of them, and um, for the ICRC, we have been present in many of these contexts for decades. Uh, in the middle of war, in the middle of crisis, peak of crisis, and so on and so forth. So one of them is the element of being there, being trusted. And for a humanitarian organization, and you were talking about healthcare workers before, the element of trust is really derived from the fa fact of being perceived as neutral, not taking sides and impartial, really delivering services, this regarding of age, group, ethnicity, language, and so on and so forth. So that preservation of a space in which trust is built is extremely important in armed conflict. And and understanding where the community's uh, drivers of hesitancy and resistance may come from. So last year, for example, in the Sahel region in Africa, we uh, convened a group of uh, Muslim scholars and religious leaders to discuss COVID-19 messaging and see and make sure that the COVID-19 messaging really resonated and was in agreement with Muslim teaching. So that way, you know that you are the information you are transmitting to communities actually resonates with them. And that's quite important. 
And the other point is working with the communities and community leaders uh, because they know leaders, but also members of the community, not only the doorkeepers that are usually men uh, in many societies, but also women leaders, youth leaders. Uh, for the ICRC, our work is very often linked with national societies, national Red Cross or national Red Crescent societies, which are networks of volunteers who live in the communities, speak the language, they know where the hesitation comes from. So paramount to really work with communities uh, to begin with. Do you find that this is, or how are you navigating this? Is, you mentioned earlier, like the nature of some conflicts are changing. And so some of those actors are changing. Are you able to maintain um, negotiations and conversations with these different groups, which it sounds like in the present day, it's so many more in, in conflict zones, it's different. Yes, conflicts have definitely evolved, evolved from a uh, conflict in which you had a, an army and then you have one rebel movement. So you had to negotiate your access with two different components of, of, a, of a conflict. Today, you might have different factions, splinter groups, different ideologies with different radicalization mechanisms. So all of these groups differ. Uh, so negotiating access is a challenging exercise. I wouldn't say more challenging than before, but it's different than before. Um, and requires really to have, the, the again, the, the trust of the communities where you operate. And it requires negotiated access. It means that this regarding of what we do, we have to announce the health activity that is going to be performed, explain why, and that element of neutrality, make sure, making sure that if you are in one side of the conflict, you are at the same time serving the communities that are affected by the other side of the conflict. So our work in the humanitarian um, sector is quite important crossing the front lines, for example, making sure that supplies go to, from one area uh, that is under government control to another area that may not be under government control. So it is, it is an exercise of negotiation that is hugely reliant on the preservation of the humanitarian principles of being neutral and being impartial and being perceived as that. So that, that's quite a key element. I know on, on the one hand, it's hard to really compare one community to another because the nature and the dynamics can be different. Um, but I wonder, Jennifer, or even Madeline as well, like, are there success stories that we can draw on um, from the past or present when you think about this? And um, I don't know if one of you, one comes to mind soon or... <laughs> I'll, I'll defer to Jennifer on that. I think you know much more about this. Um, okay, Madeline, but you actually know a great deal too, but thank you. Um, so the, coming back to this variability that um, Esperanza was talking about uh, in terms of um, different times, different circumstances, um, I can recall where working in uh, Kosovo in 1998 to 2000, I was there often with Physicians for Human Rights um, and uh, even in Albania at the start of the conflict, when we saw people fleeing from Western Kosovo into uh, the hills and mountains of Albania. But in any case, the, um, the international community of the Red Cross um, had a presence in, in uh, Kosovo, but Kosovo was pretty isolated uh, from um, the, many of the other humanitarian organizations because it, um, had not yet been hit by war. It was oppressed by Serbia. But, but when the Serbian uh, forces, both the informal forces and the formal forces invaded Kosovo, then there was um, a very big, difficult, big difficulty in uh, negotiating access. I'm not talking even about healthcare, but even access to populations to find out what was going on. Uh, because the Serbians didn't recognize any form of neutrality for civilians, that the hostility was directed at the population, uh, not at any forces in particular. I mean, later it became focused more on the uh, uh, Kosovo um, ad hoc military that formed, but it was um, a very dangerous place to move around in. And even the ICRC had to be very careful, MSF had to be very careful uh, about getting access to populations because the Serbian forces considered that a very hostile act. So that was among one of the more difficult places to see any kind of um, structures of uh, 
healthcare that could be delivered to the Kosovar population because the population was the target of the armed forces. And that was in, so it was a mixture of these newer conflicts where there, the combatants really have very little um, respect for the difference between civilians and others, but also a more formal armed conflict where you had a Serbian army um, coming in and doing, um, making assaults on civilians. So the, this issue of creating neutrality was extremely important for any healthcare provider. And it had to be negotiated with individual Serbian assailants whenever they would come up. I mean, I found this uh, uh, one of the more distressing places to um, try to uh, protect the civilian population because they were the targets of a formal military force. Wow. There, have been, there have been other times where, um, say, in Mogadishu uh, years back, when the, just the, the city was divided by two warlords. And so there was um, actually great neutrality that took place in the sense that certain kinds of humanitarians were involved in one side of the green line dividing the city and then others on the other side. But anybody crossing that green line by on purpose, but that would be um, crazy, inadvertently would get shot, including a humanitarian worker. So the way you had um, healthcare access to the civilian population was that you had to do it under the control of the warlord rules. Hmm. That works to some extent. So I want to kind of move and thank you so much into the present. And there's something I feel like at the top of this conversation that Claude and Esperanza, you alluded to and in, 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 in news, I feel like you kind of buried the lead, which is like, where are the vaccines to begin with? And like, how does that affect even the logistics and planning and negotiating of all these things? Um, Claude, I wanted to start with you is given this like, complete inequity and confusion, is there a disconnect between what higher income countries like the donors and governments in these places are ready to give and what people in conflict zones really need? Well, it's an excellent question, Ilana. You know, the point here is looking forward, okay? What do we need to bring to find a solution? And clearly it's, it's, it's about plausible, sustainable bundle of medical assistance. You know, we need to get to these environments, conflict environment, and come with something that makes sense for the population. Uh, it has to do with bundling assistance. Only COVID-19 vaccination is not going to make it. The problem of these population is not COVID. It's linked to other form of communicable and non-communicable disease. And if we do not create a bundle of assistance where we look into their priorities, it's unlikely we're gonna move forward. It has to be sustainable. It will take time to proceed with COVID vaccination, several years. And now we see the, the efficiency of the vaccine is waning. So what is the plan to sustain over time, not only once, or twice, or three, it will be several, multiple times we will need to vaccinate these population. And we take again the case of Nigeria, we're talking about hundreds of millions of people. So in terms of production of vaccines, the supply chain and the bundling of assistance, it's a major effort, but it has to be also plausible. And I think that's a major point. You know, you mentioned COVID, uh, COVAX having 20% goal of, of, of vaccination in conflict zone. It may mean, what's the goal? 10%, 8%, 15%. What are we preventing in terms of infection with 15% level of vaccination? Well, nothing, you know? I mean, all this effort to get to such a low level of vaccination, which will not have an impact on the, the if, infection rate. And that doesn't make sense then, you know? We need to rethink to go country per country, look into the countries where mutation are more likely, look into cases when we really need to invest and aims for 40, 50, 60% of vaccination, rather than to have this blanket approach that says, oh, the best that this country can get is 20%, which in fact is of no interest at all, con con considering not that it's not bundled and there's no sustainability to it. They know it's going to take several years to get to even 20%. And how, how are we going to get there if over these, this period, people don't have 
access to vaccination several times. You cannot vaccinate several times because you, you have so many more people to vaccinate. So, you know, to summarize, COVAX was a great idea, but not even, it needs really to be rethought if we are going to get out, outside this pandemic. Esperanza, what does this look like from your end in terms of, I, I wanna, Cloud mentioned two things that I wanted to ask you about um, and also have others weigh in. Um, but one is like the planning around this and the reality, how does that affect your ability to, to do this work around all of these complex dynamics? And then, you know, Cloud, to follow up, I wanna get to Cloud had mentioned like this kind of idea of what these communities need has a lot to do with like bundled healthcare and, and what, what are we missing also mm -hmm. and how, or groups, you know, in, in approaching how to be successful in these regions. Yes, and I think it is, it is when you look at the, at the situation of it all, it seems a little bit daunting uh, because as Claude said, the volumes of vaccines requires, uh, required are not there, but also what we see and from the humanitarian sector, particularly working in armed conflict, we find it extremely troublesome is the fact that there is a lack of global coordination. So countries today can get vaccines either from COVAX, which is the mechanism that we have been discussing, either from uh, direct purchasing from manufacturers or through donations. And these three things are not talking to each other. So we're talking about countries that have very weak health systems that really need a lot of preparatory work because the systems are not in place for the cold chain, the vaccinators and so on and so forth. And they are basically not receiving enough uh, notice in advance to say these many vaccines are arriving. These are the cold chain requirements. These are the expired dates. And that is a significant problem because when we talk about communities that do have a high level of hesitancy or resistance or even misinformation, disinformation or simple ignorance about COVID-19, you do need to do a lot of preparatory work on the ground. And what we, are, we have found is that even if we have the mechanism to engage with communities, even if we have the right level of information to provide, if you generate that uh, or disseminate that information and engage too early, engage too early you generate demand because immediately, oh, yes, okay, I understand COVID-19 is a problem for my community. I am willing to get vaccinated. And then vaccines are not on site. Your credibility and the ability that you have to operate in that specific environment is gone. So the, the lack of predictability in the distribution and the lack of forecasting is really, really hindering preparing the ground for whatever doses are going to arrive in the coming months and in the coming years. So that's one key factor that when Claude refers to the new mechanism in order to rethink equ equity, we also need to rethink the coordination and the, and the forecasting, because at the moment it's just not, not operational for um, conflict areas. And uh, picking up on your second point and, and emphasizing totally what uh, Claude has said, you cannot do COVID-19 vaccination in isolation. It really needs to be packed together with enhancing routine immunization. In conflict zones, you have drops of vaccination in polio or measles and mumps and rubella, 60 to 90%, depending on where you talk, uh, the, the countries that you are talking about. So when we look at mortality in the future or disability in the future, those are diseases that we need to basically prevent today. So if we're going to do COVID-19 vaccination, we need to think routine immunization and we need to think primary health care and we need to take really to have a broader view. So the whole idea of redesigning how we are approaching this issue of COVID-19 and COVID vaccination, I think is a call for us to rethink systemic approaches in armed conflict, which so far we haven't managed to, to have that global conversation to a serious level. Yeah, and that's making me think about how lots of other vaccine campaigns have been paused during this time. And now just hearing about, for example, in Afghanistan uh, during the summer, now resuming polio vaccinations and also all the other needs out there. Um, I want to take go to questions. Lots have come in from viewers. Um, and this first one comes from Veronique. Can you talk more about whether we're going to see armed conflict and refugee crises increase? Um, the Haitian migration, as an example, due to climate uh, crises and how we can link these vaccination efforts with other health and humanitarian efforts for those that are fleeing these situations. Um, I feel like all of you could weigh in on something like this, um, but I wonder if that's something uh, that 
Cloud or Jennifer? Jennifer, okay, you are ready to go. Yeah, well, I, this is something I teach about and think about, uh, climate-induced migration. And uh, it is um, interesting that the latest U.S. report that came out about uh, uh, climate change is absolutely emphatic about how climate change is linked to conflict and migration. Um, this is new language, not new to those of us in the humanitarian community, but new at the very official level coming out as declarative um, basis for policy. Uh, the the, the pro projections are that with climate change over the next um, 40 years, and I think this is a gross underestimate actually, are that there'll be mm, maybe 145 plus another 50 million in various settings that will be uh, forced by conflict and, and climate change to move outside their borders, outside. Um, that is very destabilizing to have people cross international borders, but it's also destabilizing and the numbers are very difficult to begin to estimate. So we don't have any about internal displacement within countries where uh, a certain section of the country becomes uninhabitable because of heat or drought. Um, and then people move to another. And even though it's within a nation state, as we well know, um, nation states are not um, internally homogeneous or friendly to the other. So this is a, a, a very big problem. And in the context of in the context of ongoing need to vaccinate for COVID, um, we have to place the fact that there will be ongoing need to maintain health care for people who are moving away, even from their stable sources of health care. So that the structures and operations of humanitarian health care delivery, as well as the actual um, strategies and aims for health care delivery um, in this increasingly unstable world, I think need to be merged together. In other words, this is what I think Claude and Esperanza were saying. We've got to think at a, a high level of urgency about strategies that will affect and help support people in terms of ordinary health care, routine vaccinations, and uh, warfare health care, and COVID. There's going to have to be a coherent approach to populations that are not stable, that are not in their home place, that may or may not be very hostile to each other, and that are going to be um, in unfamiliar parts of the world, their ecosystem will have been disrupted. Thank you for that. Um, this is, it's so obviously it sounds like this is all playing into an evolving um, as part of the responses. And it's, it's a new or more urgent part of taking into account and amplifying a lot of these dynamics and challenges. Um, this question is from Hunter, um, and just a bit of backdrop, um, Madeline, I want to ask this to you. Um, you know, earlier in the pandemic, uh, the UN Secretary General like, called for a global ceasefire or to allow for vaccinations, and it seemed like a really symbolic thing to kind of note that this is kind of an important global effort to, to deal with it, you know, setting aside war for something that's really threatening everybody. Um, you know, from Hunter wanted to know earlier this year, then a UN Security Council uh, resolution specified that any kind of pause or ceasefire should not apply to military operations against groups that are designated as terrorists. What's the reasoning behind that? Does it make sense from a humanitarian perspective? Mm. Yeah, I mean, the, the UN Secretary General gave this, this very uh, so the rhetorically lofty speech on uh, March 23rd of last year, when uh, every, it was clear what was going to be happening. And he said, uh, among other things, uh, he said, the, um, the, the, the fury of the virus illustrates the folly of war. So this was, this was very high flown rhetoric. Uh, but after that, really nothing changed on the ground. It, it, actually, it was, it was his speech in part that, um, uh, spurred me to want to to write this piece. Um, so so yes, I mean the the original uh, 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 declaration did did forbid um, uh, uh, de uh, organizations that were designated as uh, terrorists uh, from from um, you know from in a way receiving immunity during these uh, these campaigns. And then the, the UN Security Council in I think July of last year also excluded those groups in the same in a, in a resolution this year. 
And, uh, uh, you know, I, I don't really know the diplomatic whys and wherefores of, of excluding those groups. I mean, but one thing is clear, and, and uh, Esperanza ICRC makes, makes this very clear in its messaging that uh, civilians who live under uh, the control of, of uh, armed non-state actors are still civilians. You cannot punish them just because, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the people who are controlling their lives are, are designated as terrorists. And I talked to a number of people actually for this piece about that too, people at Geneva call and, and elsewhere. And, and they, they all emphasize that point that you're never going to really solve this pandemic or, or, you know, uh, uh, succeed in the in the larger public health goals if if you don't directly negotiate uh, in those settings with those groups. Thank you for that. Um, this question comes from Lisa, and I want to direct it to Cloud, which is um, you know as you're talking about rethinking the equity model, Lisa here is if I'm understanding this question correctly is saying you know I live in the United States, I can get a booster shot but I know it's badly needed in other places like conflict zones, a vaccine to begin with. Uh, sh how should I behave? Should I be rethinking my behaviors? Well, it's a very direct question. And I think it's one that forces us to, to reconsider this availability of vaccines. You know, the, the, you know, the long, on, on the long run, and it was mentioned by Jennifer and your questions about, you know, this interlinkage between migration, climate change, global health. Clearly, the, the local health response in countries in conflict will define the global health of, of us all, including a population in the United States. How it's going to take place actually over the, the coming years, it's, it's to be seen, but there's no doubt in um, health professionals and public health professionals that we are all linked uh, in, in this matter. So indeed, having a booster in a country, does it deprive of a vaccine another one? Absolutely. This is, this, is, this is math. But much more than that, as we've seen, that we need much more to have this vaccine to have its, its, its efficiency and to be deployed properly. Certainly, um, I would say get a booster until you have a proper uh, distribution system. Currently, we wouldn't know. We wouldn't know where this vaccine is, is going to go, how it's going to be attributed, assigned, according to what criteria, how it's going to be planned and coordinated, unless and until we have a, a proper system to tackle um, COVID in countries in conflict, we need we need to um, to focus on our own interests as well. So it's a real encouragement for people who listen to this show that we need not only to distribute vaccine but to address this global health challenge together. It's very confusing to wrap one's head around as you're talking about these lack of coordination and understanding what's even happening. Um, I want to put this question to Esperanza and also Jennifer, which is two of you. Um, but I think it really draws Jennifer also standing out to what you had mentioned uh, earlier about healthcare workers. Um, and I am really struck by this. So many have died in this pandemic um, just from the virus. I think the report from the WHO last week is up to 180,000 health workers. Um, and then, you know, they're also being targeted in conflicts. There was another study that from the summer, I believe, that found hundreds just COVID-related attacks. So what messages do you have for health workers who are trying to take part and be part of these vaccination campaigns? Because this must be such a difficult time. Um, I wonder if Esperanza and Jennifer, you might both be able to weigh in on that. We'll start with Jennifer. Oh, I was hoping you were going to start with this. For oh, well, we can do that. Let's let's switch it. Because he's, he's running a whole system, and then I can have a, a different sure. past. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Elena. And, and what is very sad as well is that if we look at the statistics of last year, attacks on healthcare workers were not only committed by armed um, actors, by the communities themselves, by civilians. 
uh, because of lack of a lack of understanding of what the disease was. And, and vaccination is not different. Uh, the fact that you aim to do vaccination and you have the information coming from a warlord or it's coming from a politician or coming from your religious leader, you do have a sense of belief that might prompt you to attack your health, the healthcare worker that is trying to help you. So it is, I think it's quite important that we emphasize the need to really provide very uh, evidence-based information to communities as much as we can, really to try to make sure that the right level of information is out there to combat misinformation and disinformation. Because healthcare workers are our front line in this, in this global pandemic. They are the ones that are basically working on personal uh, uh, preventive measures, working on hospital care, working on vaccination. So it is an extremely vital role that we need to protect. And, and we want to come back to the point that healthcare workers should be seen as not taking part in hostilities. They are believing in a service that is impartial, neutral, and they should not be attacked by anyone, including the communities they serve. Jennifer? Well, yes, I underscore that completely. And I, I would say that um, in my experience, um, and here I'm not talking about delivering healthcare, I'm talking about observing healthcare workers and structures of healthcare in conflict zones. Um, they, they should be valorized as the best um, representative of uh, what our um, aspirations as, as a world are about. Uh, relative selflessness, um, devotion to mission, um, maintaining a high level of expertise in stressful settings. Um, it, endangering themselves, not deliberately, but in terms of the work they have to do, they are put at higher risk. And this is not just in conflict zones, it's in the streets of New York City, um, it's in the countryside where people everywhere refuse to get vaccinated and there you are trying to do something that was going to take care of people against their own will, even if it's on behalf of their best interests. I think that um, if, if we're going to have an international year of any kind of actor, um, there needs to be an attention paid at the highest level of international governance, as well as the nation states, that this whole edifice of taking care of people in misery, and there are more and more of them in misery, as we're talking about, um, this entire edifice depends upon the integrity of healthcare workers, their safety, and the, the support of the mission that they embody. And it, to me, is, is extraordinarily urgent that this word get out in every country and in the international forum. And Elena, I know we are a little bit over time, but building on it. that, mental health and psychosocial support. Our every single healthcare worker around the world, disregarding of where they are, they are faced not only with having to see the suffering and seeing people dying, but also they are in their personal lives extremely affected. So I think it's a call for anyone employing healthcare workers to make sure that mental health and psychosocial support is available for the foreseeable future, because it is really, really horrific what they have been having to face in this pandemic. Thank you for that. And I keep saying thank you, but everything that you all are saying um, is really challenging how I look at and many, I hope viewers are understanding the complexities of what's happening right now. And in particular by people impacted by uh, being in conflict zones and caught in conflict and also the work of, of, of providing that healthcare and trying to uh, create avenues for vaccination efforts. Um, we've had a really rich hour of conversation, so I wanted to give everyone an opportunity to wrap up with some closing remarks. We've had some real roller coasters of some real lows in some of the challenges, and I wonder about as we think ahead, um, what your closing remarks and, and what you see as, as looking ahead to the future. Um, we'll go in the same order. So Madeline, I wanted to start with you. Sure. Uh, Ilana, I wonder if I can touch on something uh, you asked before uh, when I deferred to Jennifer. And I, I, uh, I did realize something that I, I want to mention about uh, a kind of ray of light that uh, in previous vaccine uh, ceasefire rollouts. Um, I'll make an exception for a ray of light. Okay. A and in humanitarian efforts generally. And one thing I learned uh, in reporting this piece was uh, the really 
essential role of, uh, of, of local women's groups and, uh, and women's activists, feminist activists. Um, this is something that uh, I think is, tends to be uh, ignored, but uh, the academic literature that has looked at um, these, these negotiations has found uh, again and again that uh, when women are involved in negotiating these these pauses or ceasefires, they're, they're much more successful. They're much more durable. Um, women have just these fantastically rich networks on the ground, and uh, you know, in, in my piece, uh, among uh, other things, I I, I quote, I, I spoke with a Syrian feminist uh, health activist who who said that her her little local group was able to negotiate. Uh, humanitarian pause in a, in a besieged uh, Syrian town, uh, just because you know it, very often women, uh, local women, are perceived as as uh, as non-political in a way, not non-self-aggrandizing. Their their motives are considered uh, more more uh, I don't know pure or good. So I just want to mention that. But just generally, what what I've discovered in my reporting. Um, I mean, this discussion can really lead you to, to despair, is that um, humanitarian groups, as is, is, uh, Esperanza, Jennifer, Claude have all mentioned, that they have perfected the art of engaging with local communities. I mean, they have done this for decades. I mean, th this is what they do. And... Um, the problem in uh, in 2021, and and you know, probably according to projections, 2022 and even 2023, is that the vaccines are not available to back up their their good intentions and their expertise. So in in many places, even despite these these formidable obstacles that people have talked about, they are primed to to roll out vaccine campaigns, but because of the vaccine shortage. Uh, they're hamstrung. Thank you, Madeline. Madeline Drexler, Drexler excuse me, journalist. Um, Esperanza Martinez, uh, I wonder if you would provide some closing remarks as well. Yes, thank you. I think that um, we need to see COVID-19 really as showing us how glaring, uh, how many glaring inequalities we have in access to healthcare worldwide. It's not only developed countries versus countries that are poor, or, but it's also within countries. There are segments of population that really don't have access to healthcare. So I think it is when we look at armed conflict, I think we no longer can argue that we do have a world in which you have humanitarian crisis and dealt with humanitarian aid and development post-crisis. There is no post-crisis. We are in the middle of the crisis. So it's, I think it's an opportunity, as Claude mentioned, not only to rethink what equity means in terms of vaccines, but also to think how we handle globally humanitarian crisis today, how we need to invest in a strengthening and supporting and often building from scratch health systems that are more equitable, that are able to really guarantee access for populations in an impartial and neutral manner. Thank you for that. Um, Claude Broderline, I wanted to give you a chance to provide some closing remarks as well. With great pleasure. Well, what I can tell you here, you know, we're teaching the next generation of, of global health professionals at the School of Public Health here at Harvard. And that's the message we send. You know, if we're able to tackle this global pan pandemic, we are now equipped to tackle with other global challenges, including migration, including climate change. The, the fundamentals of tackling, with, uh, tackling global challenges is, is with us. We have the tools, we have the methods. Now we need the policies and the political will to move forward. And I think um, COVID-19 is, is an opportunity, an opportunity to line up these thoughts and, and efforts and to, and to get going because we're going to have these global challenges coming at us for the decades to come and uh, it's time to start. An opportunity. Um, Jennifer. Yes, uh, thank you. I agree with um, previous um, speakers in this wrap up. I would say that uh, my focus is currently on healthcare and public health and uh, in, in these remarks. I believe that the, uh, the division of the world into uh, humanitarian zones and zones at peace and stability 
um, is obsolete. Um, the, the world is changing very quickly and in many ways deteriorating. Um, and the, the, the necessity for those who do the high level plans and develop the systems and priorities to talk with people who are actually at the level of doing healthcare and delivering healthcare is, could never be more urgent because the, what, what you have is an example. I mean, we began with the secretary general saying something lofty and then it's gotten lost in the wind and with the turmoil of all the complexity of the COVID-19 crisis, but then the other crisis that are beginning to blend with it. Uh, so it, from my perspective, we need to be um, requiring our national and global leaders to be thinking about the last mile problem. What are they doing in terms of systems and policies that will make it easier for healthcare workers and other kinds of humanitarian workers to do their jobs in situations that are affected by conflict, but also in situations that are increasingly affected by forced migration and climate change. There's so much looking ahead to be thinking about as all of you have unpacked today. Thank you so much to all of the panelists here for providing so much uh, important insight into what's happening. This concludes our event. I wanted to, again, thank you all for tuning in. And also as one final note, I wanna give a special thanks to my longtime colleague, Stephen Davey, who's leaving us at the world and uh, has been an amazing colleague in producing these forums. We will miss you so much, Stephen. Thank you for all of your work on this. This Q&A has been jointly presented by the forum at Harvard's T.H. Chan School of Public Health and the world from PRX and GBH. Thanks so much again to everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.